Welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast with me, Sean Anderson, the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media. Um, this is the show where I bring to you recruitment owners, leaders, investors, suppliers all over the world who are prepared to give up some of their time to firstly talk about their story of how they've got to where they are today. Everyone I interview is usually in, in some form of senior role in, in, a, in a really interesting business. But what we're really talking about is the future of recruitment, right? How do we grow uh, recruitment companies in 2021 and beyond that are set for the digital economy. Um, and I, I'm I'm looking to speak to people from all over the world who are doing things differently. I, I can't wait for today's episode. So uh, I'm joined, I'm rejoined on the RAG podcast by Claire Cooper. For those of you that have followed this show for since the start, Claire was featured on episode 19 of season one, 6th of June, 2019. I, I always... I like to think I might have had a bit darker hair by then, but uh, back then, but I'm not sure. It was a long um, time ago. It was so long ago, but Claire I, I and I remember it so well because I remember getting lost. You had this office in the most random part of Bethnal Green. Yeah, yeah. And it was like seven in the morning. I'm like, where? On you earth did. Am I you going? did come. And you I got there before you, and I just stood outside, like, oh, where? Where am I? Who is this? <laughs> it's like, it was like oh. under an archway in the middle of. Yeah, yeah, it was it was, it, it was my old office that we've, we've now lo no longer got clearly. But uh, Claire, at the time, was a senior executive director at Faden International, but has recently, only four weeks ago, launched the the newest brand within the Levin Group, known as Storm Three, which is a health tech recruitment business backed by three million of Series A funding, um, looking to absolutely disrupt the health tech sector, but also show. I think a lot of recruitment companies that there's a different way to do this. So Claire, welcome back to the RAG podcast. Thanks for having me back. No, it's, it's a, an it's honor. A, it's a I know. The first episode we did was wicked. I've always had I've had loads of feedback on that and people yeah. enjoyed it. So, um, you know, whatever happens, we'll have fun. Uh, but you, yeah. uh, you're doing something pretty cool. So I've just given you a little overview, but tell us, just tell us what you're doing right now and then we're going to go backwards. So just give us that like, Okay. The best way of describing Storm 3 and your role. Okay. So Storm 3, we are four weeks and one day old, which is crazy. I've, I feel, I can't believe it's only been a month. It feels like in a good way, in a good way, but it feels like it's been so much longer, I guess, because, you know, I can't, we came up with the idea probably the end of last year. Um, but Storm 3 is a health tech recruitment firm. So... When I say health tech, um, I'm not talking about big pharma or biotech. We are focused on startups and scale ups in areas like mental health tech, which is just huge femtech. So anything to do with women's health. And I could talk about that all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, fitness, uh, fitness tech. So like AR and VR and how that's all being used. Uh, anything to do with AI and how that's now being used in discovering different drugs and that's the area that we're doing. It's it's huge. Something like um, I think last year in the US, over thirteen billion dollars was invested by by VC firms into health tech. Um, so it's crazy, and it's it's it's. I have to say, I feel like we've launched at the perfect time when all of this is just completely blowing up. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, that's Storm Three. And um, four weeks yeah, we, ago, you were you you were the only person, and where you, you guys are hiring like mad. So I interviewed James, the founder yeah. of the group, and yeah. he talked about he talked about this hundred and thirty recruits in yeah. ninety days, and you're mm -hmm. part of that. So where where the hell are you yeah. guys at? Where are you at personally with that? So I'm at so I um, so at the moment it's myself. Um, I have marketing, I have uh, talent, so there's three of us, and then I have 20 hires to make for the end of April. I've already got 12, um, so eight more to go, and I'm actually going to overhire. Um, I want to uh, offer and, and hire 23, um, so if 23 start, great, but the headcount number is 20, so I want to go over that, but yeah, I'm, I'm way ahead of where, where I thought we'd be by now, um, and yeah, I've already got 12 people brilliant like amazing grads the quality is I mean we spoke about this really briefly when we spoke last week I don't think if I applied now I'd make it through the interview process well, what, <laughs> so, you've got some what's that requirement you've got you got some like you've got like an itemized uh, no so we do we have a we have a high bar and I think 
you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, we do. You have to have a two one from a certain uni. You have to be able to like run a marathon in like under an hour. So it's got to <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we do look for, we want people that are competitive or high achievers. So we have a quite long list of what is deemed a high achievement, um, which is things like national level sport, grade eight in an instrument, um, maybe climbing a mountain, not Snowden, you know, we're looking for like Kilimanjaro. <laughs> no, oh, only joking. We, we, no, we do, we do have a high bar, but you know, I, I don't think that's that's a bad thing. And oh. um, you know, we've got some amazing grads that are coming through, and I think what we can offer them um, is super compelling. So you know, they they want to join. Um, All right, I want to so, stop. Yeah, we, stop. We are. My brain's going into what I want to find out more about it, but I'm like, no, 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 that's not what we do on the rag. We go back first. Okay. You know that. So, so let's right. go back to two years ago, right? You're an executive director. Yeah. You were, I believe you were in London. There was talk of you yeah. going out to Germany, Berlin. You were talking about all this stuff at the time. Um, you know, you'd been with the business about nine, ten years at that time. You'd I was come, just coming up to my ten year anniversary. Yeah. You told me, you know, you were seventh or tenth or twentieth person, and you just painted this amazing picture of stories going over to San Fran and New York, and it was just, it was relentless. But I loved every minute of it. So. What happened next? What, what's been going on since then? So I actually listened back to the podcast the other day to remember where we were at or where I was at. And you're right, I just moved back to London. And I remember you saying, are you going to move again? And um, I said, no, no, definitely staying in London. So after that, six months later, I was living in Berlin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> bit of a common theme here. I yeah. I just, do you know what, that's the, the beauty of the recruitment industry is the ability to move around and to move to different cities and understand different cultures and set up businesses. So yeah, I, I moved into a role where I was overseeing not just the tech team in London, but also the team in Germany. And rather than going back and forth, I thought, let's just move out to Berlin. You know, it's not far from London and you know, you're never going to grow something properly unless you're there and you can feel it and experience it. And I have to say, I think I learned so much from that time in Berlin it's one thing leading teams in America, people speak the same language as you, but mm. going out to, to Germany was, yeah, a really huge learning curve. So went out there um, and that was awesome. And then got to, well, when when did kind of COVID kick in? It got to January, Feb this time last year. Um, it became very apparent that we we're all having to kind of work from home. So I got the first flight back to London, came back to my flat, was managing the team remotely from here, which was not a problem at all. And then in June, I decided to leave um, after just over 11 years. Wow. Um, so obviously I knew this question would come up. <laughs> Why? Um, before I go into it, I think I do want to caveat this by... Faden is an amazing company. I was there from very near the beginning. By the time I left, we had 11 offices around the world. I got to travel around the world. Um, I learned so much and was given so much responsibility from such a young age. And I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for Faden. I mean, James Brown was my first boss. Yeah, he hired yeah. me, you know, and I was his first ever trainee. But um, so I just want to say that because I think it is an amazing company. But I do think it's important to talk about why I left because the reality of why I left Faden is when I left I wasn't leaving just Faden I was fully intending on leaving the recruitment industry altogether wow. and wow. yeah when I look back on it I'm like Ugh. it's kind of sad when I think about it what well, was brilliant that I'm back but when I think back to kind of where my where my headspace was and the reasons as to why I think well, it's important to talk about and, and I'll explain why. Um, so I guess what led me to eventually deciding that I wanted to leave the industry altogether is I'd obviously had a very successful career. I was the most senior female uh, sales director at Faden, which in a huge business was something I was pretty proud of. And we did a lot of great things internally, actually, on, on diversity. But in the last couple of years um, in my career, it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Like I started to get a lot of recognition outside of Faden. So I was named 
by like the staffing industry analysts is one of the 150 most influential females in recruiter in recruitment. I hate talking about it because I feel like I get really embarrassed when talking about stuff like that. But I had that and then I started being asked on a lot of panels with women in recruitment and I kind of became this role model, I guess. You know, I was. I was a role model within not just, you know, Faden, but within the wider industry. And on one hand, it was brilliant and I loved it. I loved the fact that I could help influence others. But I guess I then just started to think, well, like, who am I? Who's who's my role model? Or who am I looking up to? And I just started to feel like I'd reached this point in recruitment where I I was then the role model and there wasn't, you know, I looked around at other recruitment firms or my own firms or whatever, and I just thought. I just can't see what where I go next. And so I thought, you know what? Maybe it's time to just leave and do something completely so different. The lack of female yeah. representation in other big businesses or other 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 areas of the industry made oh. you feel like yeah, maybe you've hit a ceiling now and that the, the Yeah, way. I did. And I and I and I'm not gonna lie, like in the recruitment industry, there's still so much work to be done. So it's not it wasn't in my head, it it was the reality of the situation, and I just thought I just want to take some time out and figure out what I want to do because I just felt that maybe there wasn't a place for me in the, well, I hate saying the word corporate, but the corporate world or the recruitment world. And so, yeah, I left with, like, in the middle of the lockdown with no job, uh, couldn't even leave the house um, with absolutely no plan. Um, It was mental. And... So yeah, that was in June and I took seven months out in the end. Wow. So what did you think you were going to do? Like, did you have any obvious ideas or plans? (laughs) A couple of interesting ones that I probably won't go into. So when I first left, I decided that I was not going to think about what I wanted to do for as long as possible because you know me well enough now to know how my mind works. I'm like mm. constantly thinking about new ideas. And I was like, I have to. I'm the same. Try and not, the minute an idea would come in my head, I'd be like, think about something else. Like, So I tried so hard for the first three months to not even, no one really knew that I'd left as well because my LinkedIn, I didn't change to the end of gardening leave. So no one in the industry was really approaching me. But so that was useful. Um, but I just, for the first three months, just didn't even think about it and if I did I'd go on a walk I'd, I'd just like take the wow. thought out of my mind and then I started brainstorming so um a couple of random ideas so we're well, not so random I think <laughs> my the first idea was to do um maybe like consulting on diversity so consulting into whether it's recruitment firms or tech firms on why diversity is so important and how to you know, how to change their strategy because it's something I'm so passionate about. But then the more I started thinking about it, I just thought, I I might feel like I'm making the change by consulting, but actually maybe I could make the change by stepping back into the role and, and doing what I do best, right? And being a founder and actually and, and doing it that way. I think there's far more power in doing that than consulting and and nothing really changing. So yeah. I started thinking about that. Um, one of my most random ideas, which I actually, I actually put, I haven't even told James this. Um, <laughs> I actually this put place, together, This is definitely the place to do it then. I actually put together a business plan and I emailed him about this and I'm pretty sure he's, he's, he's not listening because I never got a reply. I love Formula One. Mm. And just after, um, like, the Black Lives Matter thing happened and, you know, I'm a huge Lewis Hamilton fan, I decided, hold on, like, there's so many similarities between Formula One and technology because it's like a whole – Formula One's not just a sport. It's like a full ecosystem of of everything. Mm. And there's so many different dynamics to – and issues around diversity, even from, like, grassroots. You've got – you know, like, the majority of people are super rich. In my mind, I was like – I can solve, I can solve Formula One's plan on diversity. So I wrote a whole plan on it and actually wrote an email. Of, I actually think quite a good email 
um, to Lewis Hamilton. Never received a reply, but... Not. Lewis, come on. <laughs> that was probably my maddest idea, but I was stuck on that for like a good a good month. I like planned it all out and I... But wow. when I look back on it, I think a lot of these things were just me keeping my mind ticking over because um, I just couldn't sit there and do nothing. So um, they were some of my ideas and then... Yeah, then I just took a bunch of time out and really started to think about it, read a couple of books that kind of sorted my head out a little bit and thinking, do you know what, like, you, like you, you can't just give up on recruitment. Like, the obvious thing is to get back into what you love, agency recruitment. The thing is for you, I think, that's different than a lot of people starting their businesses is. Yeah, you were part of such a big beast and you were not necessarily hands-on billing for so long that no. go out and do what a lot of people do, which is go and start a business on their own, do the deals, build a team or yeah. Like that was never going to be an option. I don't think for you, you, no. you, you wouldn't want to do it. Like, so no, no. You... there was no way I was never going to stop. So many people thought I'd just start my own little boutique and I was just like, that just does not interest me. Yeah. Like building a 10 person recruitment business and, just no that's just it didn't it never even crossed my mind even though so I think that's what the majority of people thought I'd end up doing but it just wasn't an option so so it probably got to about October and then I started speaking to James um I had no idea um, in all honesty I, I didn't I'd never really done much research into Storm 2 I didn't really know what they were about and yeah, then I met when with him. That, when, when did you start talking to him? October. Wow, so that is a few months that. So you left in June and then... Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I mean, I just wanted to take... I I was trying to figure out... By, after a few, The first few weeks, I was like, this is... I'm never going to be able to not work. I'm, I'm going to have to get back. After a few months, I was like, how, how, how long can I figure out not working for? Um, I just... just I loved it. It was brilliant. So I just I waited as long as physically possible before realizing, hold on, I probably need to figure out a plan. I, I, was I, I was literally at the same time doing, I wasn't, I was working, but that's when yeah. I left London. I buggered off to Spain. I was in Spain for six weeks, but I said the same thing. I was like, cause I, I was like, I don't know where I'm going to live after this. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I went yeah. back, I moved in with my brother for a bit and then I went to Spain and I'm sat in Ibiza with everything shut going, I'm just going to give it six weeks. I'm yeah. not. Gonna, I'm not going to think about where I live. I'm going to work it out at the end. And a bit like you, I'm not going to think about where I'm going to work. But I can't do that. So two weeks in, I was like looking at flats and signed up to one in Manchester. I just had to do it. Like my brain. Really? Did you feel that? Did you get itchy when you were? No, like, uh, I did at the beginning, but then I was able to completely, um, yeah, completely relax. So I, I actually left London. Um, quite early on went to so this was during when we were able to fly again and before even like the second wave came so I actually I went to a yoga retreat in Turkey for like three weeks wow I was the only person there so and there was no wi-fi so that definitely helped uh definitely helped and I just I just turned like got to the point where I like, turned off my phone I just didn't really communicate with anyone and I think when I finally got it to the point of relaxing, yeah, I got into it. But it, it took a while. It, it definitely took a while. But then when I got there, it was brilliant. Um, oh God, sounds amazing that right now. Like the, the thought of a yoga retreat in Turkey with no phone. Fucking, hell, I'd go. I'd go. I I'd, I'd shut the, yeah. the laptop after this episode, and I'd be gone. I'll see you all in a week. Um, but all right, let's get back to what. When it came to October, you said you'd not yeah. really look. You obviously knew James was doing what he was doing, oh, but yeah. you, weren't, you weren't paying enough attention. Did you, no. what did you drop him an email and say, how are you getting on, mate? I'm back in the... Yeah, back in the I mean, house. like, James was my very first boss, right? And I was his first hire. So we've got, we've always had a really close relationship. And, you know, we we spoke after I left, but not in the capacity of me joining. He was like, Claire, just, just take as much time off as, as, as you want. Like, just from his experience of when he left, he was like, you're going to have all these different thoughts of what you want to do. You might turn around and decide you, I don't know, want to be a florist or be a yoga teacher or whatever. You might just, who knows where your mind's going to take you in the next six months. So we spoke in that capacity, but never really about me 
coming on board because at the time I naively thought Storm 2 was just him and a couple of guys in a tiny office not really doing much so then when we finally started chatting I I just had one question for him I and my only question was why have you got investment so early on I couldn't figure it out Mm. I thought has he I know that he walked away from a lot of money but he also did quite well at the last day I was thinking did he really like I know he had a year off but did he really spend (laughs) does he spend all his money um I just couldn't figure it out because obviously the majority of recruitment firms are bootstrapped you don't need you need a laptop you don't even need an office anymore now everyone's remote and I just couldn't think I was like why it makes no sense why they've got all this money up front and then when he started explaining to me the business model um and he went through like the investment deck with me and then obviously Adam Buck um got involved it just yeah everything started falling into place we started talking about storm three and yeah it all went from there did he know that was going to happen like was he already planning storm three anyway yes i think he always knew that it was going to be a a multi-brand recruitment model I think he already um, had your name written down underneath it. But, but he already had I think he probably did. And I think I'm I'm naive to I don't know why I never thought that he would want to he, yeah. as if I as if James would ever just do Storm Two. Of course yeah. he was going to build a multi brand recruitment model. But um yeah, we started talking about it and it just it generally that the the business model and, and how we're looking to grow and the way that we're doing it so differently to what's been done before, which I know is easy for us to say, but it's so true. And I just couldn't not be. What did he say though? Was... Well, how did he answer that question? Because I was, I remember when I went to an investment seminar thing a couple of years ago and yeah. they were like, you know, they, they basically said, do, do not be prepared to ask for investment if you're not going to put the money in your own business. So if you're not going to put your own pounds in, why, why would you expect somebody else to? So that, that kind of leans back. If James has already got X amount of money anyway, why did he need to go elsewhere to get external cash? Couldn't he have just funded it in, himself? I mean, he could have done, but I think that's 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 not the point. That's not the play that he wanted to go for. He didn't want to just build his own bootstrap company. Like that money has come from our investors to help us grow as quickly as possible. So that went into the systems, the technology that we use, which is amazing. It went into being able to hire and attract a pretty solid senior team. Um you know, he's brought on myself, Aaron Chan, Candy Chong in Singapore, Angela in Amsterdam, Kay, who runs Delp Storm 4. You know, he invested that in talent. Um, and yeah, it allows us to to grow as quickly as we can because we have the money to do so. It doesn't mean like we're, we're throwing money around, um, but it means that all the tools that we need, we can have now rather than waiting what five ten years or whatever it might be to 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 have that amount of money so yeah it makes perfect sense for us and also we model the business or he the the business model is much more akin to a a tech startup right rather than a recruitment rather than a recruitment firm and i'll kind of go into that in a minute into because that plays into how i can hire 20 people in one go which i know people are quite curious about but I mean, that's how tech companies grow. They get the seed funding, they get the Series A. You know, they're getting money thrown at them before they've even got a prototype. And why why is recruitment not like that? Why does everyone just do it with their own money and then wait for such a long time to reach a valuation to be able to sell? Like, why? Why why can't we do what tech tech firms do? So that's exactly what we did. Mm. So you met him in October and you started having this conversation. How long Mm -hmm. until you were in? I mean, I was in the minute I spoke to him. I just didn't know what I was doing. I did, in the sense of, I genuinely, whatever role he he wanted me to do by that point, I I would have done it. I was like, I just just, you know, it's, it's it's such a cliche, but it didn't matter what the role was. I just knew that I wanted to be a part of this whole crazy story, right? And you know, especially with Adam being involved. Adam is someone I've been extremely close to throughout my whole career. You know, there's no way I was going to walk away 
and then saying no thanks I'm gonna go go do something else so um I was in the minute I spoke to him but it probably took us yeah a couple of weeks to flesh out exactly what what role made most sense and storm three 100 for us made the most sense and the whole health tech piece was that something they'd they'd already done the research on or did you come in and go right i'm going to figure out where i want to focus it's a bit of a mixture i think um a lot of thought has gone into the markets that we do right they are markets that are getting huge amounts of investment and attention and that are also purposeful we want to work on you know, we want to work in industries that people are excited about working in. So um, we already have the fintech piece. Um, and yeah, it just makes perfect sense. Health tech to be the second brand, clean tech to be the third brand. And then the fourth brand, which will be Storm 5, will be e-commerce. So um, yeah, it was a, a mixture of both. I think in my mind, I was thinking that I wanted to kind of do something more related to the health tech world, because I just think, I, well, firstly, I was on a crazy health kick at the time. Um, and it's just such an exciting market. And they had kind of earmarked that. So it just worked out perfectly, to be honest. I'm interrupting this episode of the RAG podcast to bring you a message from our sponsor, Audro. You know by now that Audro are the number one video interview platform for recruiters around the world. Now, they keep bringing out new features from Audro Capture to Audro Producer and it just keeps getting better and better and better. But now, recently, they've just announced a new feature to the platform, which is a complete game changer. During COVID-19, they realized that the recruitment audience, the communication was changing. Globally, their clients and candidates were, were using Microsoft Teams and Zoom more than anything else. The phrase, let's jump on a Zoom call or jump on a Teams call has actually replaced the, the words video interview for a lot of their conversations over the last six months. Now, they were thinking, do we, I mean, how are we going to er eradicate this? How are we going to make Audro the name that everyone talks about for, for the interview process? And they realized they didn't need to. They needed to integrate. So for the first time ever, they, they're the first video interview platform on the planet that have decided and managed to integrate with Zoom and soon to be integrated with Microsoft Teams. So with one click, after recording a Zoom video, you can now drag that into Audro and create everything else that Audro has from adding the CV, the heat maps, the capture, and the producer elements. You get all the benefits of Audro before and after the interview, but you get to use Zoom, which is client friendly on all levels. So this is massive. Teams is coming. It's the first time anyone's ever done it in our sector, and it is literally going to change the way you work in 2021. Get in touch with my friends over at Audro at audro.co.uk, or if you're already a user, reach out to your account manager to make sure you've got this feature. Back to the show. Okay, you're back in the game. You're, yeah. you're four weeks ago, you're starting off. Tell us, what was, that, what was that like, coming back from such a long period of time? How did you feel? What was the emotions? What was the first uh, day? Paint the picture for us. So... It's interesting because I'd been working, so October, I think late October is when I signed, right? And that gave me a good few months to start really thinking about like how I wanted to build the brand and the markets that we were going to be doing. So I spent actually quite a lot of time thinking about it, probably too much time in that I like sometimes I had to just switch my laptop off and just remind myself, you haven't actually started working yet. Like the whole point is to chill and to rest. So when it came to day one, I, it didn't feel like too much of a shock to the system from not working to starting working again. But yeah, I mean, it was crazy. I think I remember saying to you in the last podcast that when we went to, when I opened up our office in San Francisco, we had no clients and we had no candidates. And that's true. But we did have a database which had some candidates, some clients on it, some in some capacity. My first day, I, <laughs> I literally sat on my laptop and uh, with Bullhorn, never used Bullhorn before, and literally zero candidates, zero clients. And I just was like, fuck, right? I, I don't even know how to add a candidate, like, phys like physically, how do I do this? So it's pretty simple. You just go to candidate and add, right? Like it's the most intuitive um, CRM I've ever used. But it was... Yeah, it was it was it was crazy. And, you know, for me, the next well, the first three months, there's only two things that I'm focusing on. A is hiring 
so hiring talent um so to hit the 20 or the, the 23 that I want to get and be recruiting myself which has been a crazy ride because I have not recruited hands-on <laughs> for such a long time and uh and I've never recruited how are you getting on <laughs> you sound like James and um, I'm actually doing all right actually you know we've got we I we um I'm actually doing okay I've like dusted off the cobwebs um I love recruitment you know I don't want to be a recruiter but it's so important to me to understand the market I'm not recruiting for the next three months with the purpose of obviously it would be great to get some NFI and to build right great like to put a dent into to, to the budget but this is more for me to understand how our clients work, understand the nuances of the different types of firms, understand how the candidates work. You know, it's just more about me. Like, I want to make a load of mistakes. I want to get things wrong. I've already made a couple of very interesting mistakes and getting confused. Um, but it's more for me just to, to really figure out exactly the system and the science of recruiting in health tech in the next three months so that when the grads start i've got a very robust model for them to to come into what can you learn in that because that is like proper you know in three months you'd expect that someone would just have they, they did have quite surface level knowledge of a space well yeah but that's the thing it's like i'm it's i'm having to learn but i'm also having to unlearn so many things <laughs> it's, it's, it's like when you're a if you're just a recruiter and as a grad, you, you you don't know what you don't know, right? And I'm, I've spent months and months with all this kind of like big picture thinking about Storm 3 and, and what we're going to do. And actually now I'm sitting here having to be very just recruiter mindset. And, you know, I think the biggest thing that I've learned is whilst, yes, we've got a great story and, and yes, my background is fairly impressive having lived in all these different cities and, and you know, I know that I'm, a good or was a good recruiter and I can still do it but it made me realize that clients for the most part don't really care you know like you know I was saying to a client the other day you know I spent 11 years with Faden and then and they thought they were like you worked at a book publisher for 11 years and now you're working at health tech like you know it's made me realize that recruitment is so simple you need to find amazing candidates and put them in front of exactly the right the right clients and that's the science you know um what, what mistakes have you made then so tell us what you mentioned one that made oh me. don't i it was just little things like i'm such i am so passionate about terms like for me i don't see why any recruiter should ever work less than uh, less than 25 percent terms it's crazy and i think we are so, we are, I think now, especially after the COVID and the pandemic, I like to think the mentality in the industry is changing a lot where people really realise the value of us. So I get, as you can tell by the way I'm talking, um, I have always been hot on agreeing good terms and not devaluing. So I, now that I, I remember saying that and I remember having a conversation with someone about it before and I've got a big thing in front of me which says 25 percent like don't go below that then obviously I had a call with a client he's got like 15 roles and wanted to do 12 percent and I actually caught myself for like five minutes thinking modeling it out and thinking how can I somehow swing <laughs> swing this one and figure it out so funny things like that you know where you just I obviously did definitely walked away but you know little things like that where you just you know it just make make you laugh and I think probably the biggest this is a bit embarrassing but um it's a peloton you know the, yeah the bikes yeah the bikes um obviously they're an amazing company I'd love to work for them uh, work with them as a client or any candidates from there you know that is the type of when it comes to like fitness tech space, that is like the gold standard. So a, uh, a candidate came into my inbox, female candidate, brilliant. You know, we have a big focus on placing female talent. She worked at Peloton. She's in San Francisco. I, you know, messaged her. I was like, yep, talk, talk whenever you want. You know, like I just wanted to talk to her. So she, eight hours behind, 
ended up not being able to speak to her so like late at night I sat up just waiting like can't can't wait to have this call and <laughs> we, we we do this call and about 20 minutes in I'm like it doesn't sound right what she's saying she's talking about how they've just laid a lot of people off and um like the business model changing and they're doing and I'm like this doesn't like as far as I'm concerned like they're absolutely flying so I went on her LinkedIn so you know when you can actually click on the companies because I just had a CV in front of me she works at um so there's a a small little trucking company in the like the middle of nowhere in California, <laughs> also called Peloton. And then it wow. clicked. Is and I, was the like, same, I was like, I can't, I can't wrap up the conversation straight away. You know, wow. like, I've just wow. spent 20 minutes selling the dream. Like I've got, and uh, I just, but little things like that, you come off and you've just got to, you just got to laugh and think, do you know what? That's, it's, it's things like that, which is so important for me to go through that myself. So that, when yeah. they graduate, yeah. they can, you know, but they hopefully yeah. won't make those mistakes. But yeah, that's Have the one that sticks by me. Uh, yeah, that's... You could get some work on with the trucking industry. You never know. Don't. My, yeah, I know. Why not? Um, but yeah, no, that's, it's funny. Lots of little things happen like that. But that's what I love about recruitment, right? It's, you can have all the experience in the world. Recruitment's recruitment. You know, it's, it just, you're not, doesn't, just because I've got 12 years experience doesn't mean that I'm going to, be perfect. A final interruption to today's episode to introduce Vincere. Vincere is the all-in-one CRM ATS platform built for the recruitment and staffing industry. Now, I first heard about these guys about a year ago. The amount of prospect recruitment agencies and clients I was working with that were telling me they were moving over to Vincere, I had to look into it. And what I found was a business that had a global reach um, with multiple offices around the world. So they've got this follow the sun methodology, which allows them to support recruitment businesses wherever you are and, have, and, and be in your time zone. But the technology that they've invested in um, is becoming a, a disruptor in the space. More and more recruitment businesses are, are doing this to give their, their recruiters a competitive advantage. They broke into the G2 Crowd's momentum grid as a market leader based on their reviews from their customers. So the, the agencies that are using this platform are raving about it. Now, if you're a rag listener and you're thinking about changing CRM or you're a new business looking to launch with a new CRM, then I would get in touch with, the, with these guys because if you mention that you're a rag listener, they're doing an amazing deal. By visiting www.vincere.io forward slash rag, you can get an exclusive deal which offers two months completely free on a two-year commitment or three months completely free on a three-year commitment. This applies to all licenses that you've either signed up for now or that you'll add in the duration of the contract. So get on there and have a look. Finally, if you're listening to your recruiter and you're thinking, I want to move into a more of a business development role um, and I'd like to keep hold of my recruitment knowledge. Well, these guys are recruiting for a BD person, well, multiple roles in both Sydney and London right now. So if you've got a strong recruitment background, you want to move into BD and you want to work for a fast moving tech business that's helping people like you right now, then get in touch via their website because they're hiring today. Back to the show. So what what does the 12 years experience bring, right? So you're yeah. going end of April, you've got 20 people, 23 people start, right? That yeah. would shit the, the hell out of most people in, yeah. in the industry. Yeah. You know, 20 people at once. Like, how are you approaching this? So, like, because you that is where your yeah. experience will kick in, in my opinion. So uh, what, what does that mean? Like, how yeah. do you even do it? So I actually don't think the ability to do it is about the level of experience that I have. I think it probably helps a little bit that I'm got the experience and probably more confidence but the way that we're able to do it and I have to say when I first spoke with James and again I haven't even told James this I I generally thought this is crazy like this is never going to work surely he means 20 across the first year like not who hires 20 people in one go and it's only when I listened to his podcast with you this is before I started. I realised, oh no, right, okay, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want go? I was like, okay, right. Do you know, what? I'm not. I'm, I'm just. Okay. Play in this. I'm happy. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, right. And then, but when I joined, and I realised the model that we have, it makes perfect sense. So I'm going to try and articulate it because I've had a lot of people ask me this question. So, in a normal. And for anyone that's listening on the podcast, they can't see all my hand gestures, which are really trying to yeah. help knock this out. But okay, so in a normal recruitment firm, 
you would typically have like the, the normal model is you'd have your director at the top three or four principal consultants and then below that they might have three or four people in, in their team as well right to take them to 20. then there might be like an l d person floating around helping here and there um there might be a central marketing function helping make things look pretty or whatever they're doing um but that is typically how most recruitment companies are built and that's the model and then it's you build up like that we're taking a completely different approach so it's not just me and 20 grads like that would be crazy so the model that we have is very similar as i said we refer to it as similar to a tech startup in that we have me we have i have my own people ops person so people ops is i'm not sure if this is the right way to phrase it but it's like lnd on steroids it's it's it's, it's a really bad analogy yeah. but it's like ellen dish and it's purely focused on storm three so this person will understand health tech so it's not then they're not working with storm two or storm four as well they're purely focused on storm three but their role is not only helping make people amazing at recruitment but making them amazing at the systems that we use so the te technical systems so whether it's linkedin bullhorn we've got about three or four other integrations that we use so making them amazing at that but then also using a lot of data to help drive their activity and help push their activity and then it's basically like, like a second person to, to me to help drive that performance so i'm not having to be the one you know what it's like when you, with with 20 grads it's a lot of it is like click here and then click here and you know you're having to teach everything from recruitment to how to use LinkedIn, how to write adverts. My people ops person is there to help do that. Then we've got marketing, again, purely focused on Storm 3. And not only is that just brand marketing, which I think we've got some amazing marketing for anyone that follows the Storm 3 LinkedIn page, but they're actually much more focused on working with the consultants in understanding how to use LinkedIn, understanding inbound marketing, understanding adverts, how to optimize adverts. They are focused on helping the consultants ensure they're getting the most out of the platforms from a, I guess, a marketing perspective. And then also have a commercial person. So someone that is purely focused on anything to do with terms, exclusivity, any kind of documents or pitches for clients. And then my talent person that's focused on hiring for me, but also when they are onboarded, kind of still working with them as they integrate. So I hope I'm getting to explain this in the right way, because in my head it makes sense. But what that means is we've basically got five people, including me, and the 20 grads. But between those five people, we all have quite different responsibilities yep. and different skill sets. So in fact, you end up having a, a yes, ultimately there's 20 people accountable to me, but actually the ratio is still no more than one in no, one what, to four or five, if that makes sense. How do you split up what they're all going to do? Like they're all grads, no one's got experience. What's the kind of, how are you, how are you differentiating what one person does from another? Is it, are you putting them in teams or pods or contracts? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So in terms of market, so Storm 2, Storm 3, Storm 4, we do exactly the same vertical markets. Right. So that's, uh, data and analytics, uh, development and oh, DevOps and engineering, commercial, product, finance and ops. So six verticals. We will not do any more or any less than that. And Storm 2, Storm 3, Storm 4 do exactly the same. Right. So that's our model, right? We do the same candidate model, but to the different end industries. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So the, out of the – but we're not – I'm Storm 3 aren't going to do all six first. That would be crazy. Um to do all six um so we're going to do four so three uh four teams of five doing all doing a separate area right okay and will you will the model be to promote one into a leadership role in each pod so that you oh, have yeah eventually yeah. yeah so if you look at storm two um so they're obviously what we look at to kind of to model storm three on um they've just promoted um two people uh, Jamie and Stefan, who are now managing the sub teams. So that is that is the plan. That out of that twenty people, hopefully within a year, eighteen months, 
people will step up to manage those teams. And then we'll, that will allow me to then bring on another 20. And what is the what is the plan? Is, is there like a year to embed them or have you got have you got to keep 20 for a certain period or do you have to grow it again at a certain time so we do we're following a plan of two cohorts a year i think in a lot of other recruitment firms they're always hiring which is a good thing but then you end up with a team of just such different like such mixed abilities so we're really strict in that we're going to have two intakes a year for every brand and and that'll be every six months. And it also is great because it enables us to, you know, at the moment we're in, we're interviewing a lot, but our interview process is actually not too time intensive, but it means that, you know, JB right now is doing it. He does all the final rounds, right? But it means that he gets that out of the way and then we can carry on and then we'll have another big drive and then hmm. we'll carry on. So that's the plan. I like it. I like that. You are, you are literally saying, this is how everyone else does it. We're going to do that. Just so everyone yeah. else, this is, we're going to do that. We're going to do it differently. Yeah, we are. And I just think... Perm and contract or just perm? Oh, perm. 100% perm. Um, we're sticking to what we know. I think our, our, our rule is no experiments. Um, so we're only going to hire senior people, people that we know or are referred to us. We're not going to open offices in random locations or, you know, open offices in different countries where people don't speak that language you know no experiments and and for us none of us know contracts we don't it's not our expertise so yeah we're what, just about about, what about from a value perspective though surely that's what your contract obviously gives you that annuity income is it i i think back in the day a lot of recruitment firms used to think having the contract business will drive your value up and actually i think that there's been enough big valuations in perm recruitment models to prove that you can still get a big valuation without without having a contract business. So we just want to make sure we have an amazing perm business and look at different things to get a higher multiple, which does not include having a contract business. Yeah. Well, I think as well, when you've got a bigger business with more scale, it's slightly different. When you've got a tiny 10-man band and the big contract book, you can see there's a lot of value in that because the people, you know, it doesn't take long to churn the whole staff over. Whereas if you might have... 200 300 500 people slightly yeah. different what what um what do you expect from your 20 grads individually in the year in year one what are you targeting these people and how so this is is it's a, well, it's a good thing yeah it's a good thing so storm two have, have really set the standard for um for what to expect for the guys at storm three and storm four so to give you an example um i'm sure she won't mind if i say um there's uh, a girl called katie she's 21 that works at storm two and she's been there less than a year she's done 11 deals wow she's killing it and the majority of the team at storm two i remember in my first week i joined in their weekly um end of you know end of week roundup and nearly everyone was on 10 interviews and that, that's the standard 10 interviews that's what i was brought up on 10 interviews and a lot of that you know over the years it started to become five and you know i think and nearly everyone's on 10 it's crazy that the the standard that storm two have set so for me i'm holding myself accountable to being at that standard or hopefully you giving them all have they got to hit like 100 grand or 120 or is there any like is there a monetary number on their head when they join there's a monetary number in terms of what they want to do to get promoted to the next stage absolutely um and yeah we, we are i hate using the word kpis I, I just hate using it but we are very data driven and we are constantly giving feedback on what people are doing and what they need to do to perform but yeah do we have a number of right you need to build this amount in in a year like, no obviously we've got some targets around probation and performance and you know, I'm not going to go into that, but I actually think rather than looking at what they need to do, we use examples of some people that have absolutely killed it. Yeah. And in Storm 2, to show what good or great could look like. And, you know, thankfully there's been some absolute superstars in Storm 2 um, that are proving that our model is working. 
And the model is stick to one market. Don't deviate. You mentioned this before. Yeah. Like, you guys will not step outside of health tech. Like they won't no. step outside of fintech. And no. that's no. where I think a lot of people go wrong is they, 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 they become a product of their own success. They get invited to things to get, you know, it sounds good. It's business. Yeah. The lure of it. And then you dilute your proposition quite quickly. Exactly. And I think that's what I struggled to get around my head around a little bit at first because I, you know, at my old company, we worked across all areas of tech. And, you know, I spoke to Kay about this uh, the other day. So Kay runs Storm 4. And we were saying how we have having to retrain our minds of if we're getting leads from candidates in other industries, we're not going to chase them. Or I've got so many clients that I used to work with in like the high frequency trading space that I'm really good friends with, but like we'll never work with them in any capacity across any of the brands. It's but by being super focused and only focusing on health tech, it means that a the consultants will be experts, and it means that we really can become totally synonymous with the market. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, every candidate and client will know Storm Three is the place to go for for health tech. So yeah, you've got to be strict with it and there's going to be missed opportunities of maybe old clients calling you asking if you can help and you saying no or, you know, candidates you're working with move to different industries that don't fall in hours. But you've just got to be able to turn all of that away and focus on the end goal, which is for Storm 3 to be, you know, the most well-known and biggest health tech recruitment firm. And we're not going to do that. We start doing other things. I love the names like Storm 2, Storm 3, because it's interesting. Yeah, because it gives you that straight away that feeling like you're there to disrupt, like yeah. you're there to create a storm. Like you're not here to piss about. You're not here yeah. just to blend in. You're absolutely not here to blend in. I don't think you and James could ever blend in. I think the whole <laughs> point is <laughs> too much going on there. Really? Um, but I just, yeah. I just, I find it fascinating. What, what yeah. does it look like post COVID then? So you bring in twenty grads. Are they all remote? Mm -hmm. Is that the plan? Are they all in London? Where, where? How is this happening? So. Ideally, I mean, ideally, we would love to all get back in the office, right? I, especially for, for the grads, you know, every grad I've interviewed, they're like, I just need to get out of the house. Yeah, that is You know, great. I think, it, like, they just, and especially because most of them are living with their parents mm. and they've been living with their parents since, like, having to, you know, they had to come home from uni. And they're, I, I, seriously, every grad I speak to, I feel so bad for. They're like, I just need to, like, please, can I come to the office? Like we haven't even started. You don't even start till April. You can't go in yet. Um, but yeah, ideally we want to get everyone in, just because I think the best thing about recruitment is the people. All my best memories from the last twelve years are based around the people, mm. and so we do want to get people in. But I don't think we're, you know, I think we've got to play it by ear and and, and figure out how that works. I think we'll probably do fifty fifty capacity. Um, see how that goes I don't think we'll ever go back to you know 100% being in the office every day of the week definitely not I think I know a lot of other recruitment firms are going to be marching people back into the office when they can but I think we're going to have a really flexible um kind of like work from home policy but yeah ideally we want to get people in because that's the fun bit about it yeah I agree. I agree James said that as well um, James said the same thing it's such a tough job that to be on your own doing it. I mean, I, I just think it depends on your age and lifestyle. I think if you're hiring grads, like you yeah. said, working at home or living at home or, you know, living with friends, you know, they're not necessarily yeah. set up individually with a desk and a setup. Whereas when you're, yeah. a, if you've got a mature agency where everyone's late twenties, early thirties, then, you know, they're probably not itching to get back in five days a week. So it's, yeah. it's about understanding that. What, what about this location? Have you have you gone for London? Everyone's in London, so that when you have that opportunity yeah. to bring them in, yeah, 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 yeah. So everyone is in London, so or moving to London with the view that we will eventually be in the office, whether that's two, three, four, five days a week, whatever it might be. But yeah, we're not we're not going to a full remote model, not at all. And what? Where do you see? So we're we're wrapping up now in the sort of last few five ten minutes. Where what, do you see this? I know fifty minutes. I'm not even started. Where? Where does this go? Like, where, where, where? What's the vision for for Storm Three specifically? Like, where do you see locations? Where do you see the growth plan? Like, what's the yeah. three to five year vision for it? Cool, Storm Three. Um, the vision is two hundred people for Storm Three within the next three years. So sounds crazy. 
but it's not crazy. Like we've done it before. We can do it again. You know, like I, I know it sounds mental, but I know that we can do it. Um, so location wise, we already have um, a license and, and well, we have to have Storm 2 on the ground in Singapore already. We have Storm 2 on the ground in Amsterdam. We've just got the uh, the license for New York. We're setting up New York ASAP for Storm 2. And then we'll start deploying Storm 3 into those locations. So ideally, we want to have Storm 3 in all of those locations and probably the West Coast um, within the next 18 months max. Wow. That's what I'm going to yeah. say. It's nuts. It feels... I, I, I believe you'll do it. Like I know I've met you all pre this. I, I, I don't have any doubts. It's just... I, I literally, well, we've done it before. We yeah. can do it again. You know, all the episodes I've interviewed anyone like no one talks like this. Like literally, no one. You get you get high growth plans, but this is a joke. What what does that look like for the whole group by that point? Then, so where will the the Levin group be? And when you hit two hundred, where will it be as a portfolio? Uh, in a very good place is all I'm going to say. We've got some ambitious, uh, but very achievable and very well planned out goals of where we're going to be in terms of headcount and valuation by that point. You must have like um, what? Storm Storm 2 will what have four or 500 by then? You will be two. Mm -hmm. Storm 4 at two. You're talking like six yeah. to a thousand people, aren't you? Like, yeah. and that's before you even hire anyone any or build any other brands. We've um, still got Storm 5 to go and six and seven and eight. No, I'm joking. But it's only four brands. There will only ever be four brands. Okay. I okay. think I was saying to you, I think I think James has bought the domain name yeah. for every storm up until I don't believe it I don't believe you stop at four I think you'll get too excited if it's working why would you stop like you'll just keep going knowing you lot I think you only need I think four four specialist recruitment firms is is enough to build a really successful multi-brand model yeah you know, we don't want to overcomplicate it it sounds really complicated when we speak about it but it's actually so beautifully simple what we're doing hmm. that's the bit that yeah like you We'll never, not everyone won't, you can't tell that from a podcast. Like, you know, you've got to be in the, you've got to be in the detail. Well, oh God. Well, I mean, I didn't do it, mate. Sorry, I didn't understand. I did not understand until I joined. So if, if someone is sat there going, look, Claire, I know you can't tell me that everything, but I'm, I want to know more. I want to know, give me, can you give us like the, the three main things that you think are going to make this happen? Like what are the three ingredients that other people can, in, it might inspire someone else to take that. And, and, and do something about it? I think mentality, 100%. You know, obviously there are days when I'm thinking, oh my God, I, I, can we do this? Like, am I going to be able to do this? This is crazy. But I think the mentality, like we are all so passionate about doing this and making it happen and relentless in, in achieving our goals and our vision so I think mentality is, is the first thing and as I said you know you've got myself you've got James you've got Adam Buck involved you've got Candy who was also a director at Faden International you've you know we've we've done it before so we can do it again so I think mentality is probably the first thing I think the second thing is keeping it simple we are keeping things really simple I think in tech you can so easily so many tools and platforms and different things you can do like every every week there's like a new trial for some different ai tool or plugin that you can use or a different job board we're keeping it really simple in terms of what we use because i think in tech recruitment you can just make it so complicated and convoluted and it just doesn't doesn't need to be like that just stick to your model and just be amazing at that model um and then the third thing is, yeah, just being, continuing to be really focused on hiring the best talent and not letting our standards slip. Wow. If we have any doubt on any candidate, it's a no. Any doubt, it's a no. And I think that's really important to us that as we, we keep growing and we keep hiring, that we don't then start to to lower the standards in the type of people that we want to hire. I think that's definitely key. Wow. I love that. I love that. And what would you say your, what was your biggest learning from when, now that you've left Faden and you're out, yeah. what would you say is the, 
What did you learn the most about from what did you take them from Faden? Do you think that's going to set you in good stead here? Like, what's the one or two things that that you would look back on and go, my experience there is why I'll bring that over. I think the realizing that anything is possible, definitely. I mean, I I set up an office in San Francisco when I was twenty five. Mm. I no, I didn't. James. James flew out to Singapore at 23, you know. I don't think he'd never even been to Asia and he just, just put on a plane to go and set up an office. So I think definitely the mentality is one thing that I would take from Faden. And I think it was such a brilliant journey and we were all given so much opportunity. So I think that is one thing I'll definitely take. Um, I think the second thing I'll take is just you know, the most important thing, you know, as I said, all my best memories from Fadum are around the people, the people, the fun that we had, you know, you know, just those interactions. So I'll definitely take that with, and I'm still such good friends with so many people from there. I think I take that with me is that remembering like, yes, we have these crazy plans and yes, we're very methodical in terms of what we're doing, but actually it's the people that, that matter that's the main thing that is going to make you know getting out of, out of bed every day um like a, great you know it's, it's who you're working with so i think that's probably the main things i'll take and how do you keep yourself on track like when you look back at the fade in days i know you've had a big yeah. time out and you're back in but when yeah. you're running such when you're running such big teams at such ridiculous pace with so much pressure mm -hmm. what's your secret to keeping it all together because a lot of people, like, you know, they wouldn't last 10 years in that environment. What what do you do that keeps you going? Oh, going on a lot of holidays, no. I haven't been, yeah. I, 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 I don't always get it right. And, I mean, you and I have spoke about, I spoke about this a little bit last week. I know that my personality, I can become so consumed by something I'm so passionate about. I think I've definitely learnt when I need to relax, when I need to have a break when I need to go on holiday I think yoga I could go on about yoga all day but that definitely is something that has helped a lot in enabling me to switch off and just little things like working from home at the moment I'm really strict I don't have emails on my phone there's no point having work emails on your phone when you're working from home so I'm never you know in bed checking emails um my laptop I make sure I shut it down you know every night and you don't have work you don't have work emails on your phone at all what's the point there's no point because you only used to need it on your phone if you're going out and meet for meetings like it's i realized after i after i left faden the amount of times i'd just be scrolling on my work emails for absolutely no reason i'd be with my friends or i'd be doing something and it, you, it's so you get into such habits and i just decided i'm not going to get them on my phone and i'd there's no need because I'm sat in front of my laptop. I can't, I can't, uh, the, the biggest thing I'm going to do is pop to Tesco. Like the, what's going to happen? Like it's fine. If someone needs me, they can call me. So little things like that. I've been really focused on just allowing myself to, to switch off because it's, it's hard enough switching off when you're launching something you're so excited about, but when you're doing it working from home yeah. during a lockdown, you've got to, to really force yourself to take that, to take breaks or whatever you need to do. Otherwise, you're just going mental. It's difficult though, isn't it? Like I'm the same now. <laughs> like, you know, we're doing so many things at once from yeah. trying to raise money for schools to building, mm -hmm. new time, to launching the academy, to hiring people around the world. It's been, it's, I'd say the start of this year has just been insane. And I've, I've started the Headspace app every day, like using it. And yeah. Like I was, I was always dabbling with it, but I started paying for it in January. I use it every day, and I, I don't know what what difference it's making, but I definitely yeah. feel, I definitely feel a little bit calmer when I start my day than I did before. I used to wake up, and I think the problem was check, I check my emails too soon when I wake up, and I need yeah. to, stop that. I need to delete it. I might, yeah. I might delete it straight away. Like, and know. also, I remember when I first started recruitment because I'm trying to get my mindset into being a 21 year old <laughs> Claire recruiter again. I remember I never had emails on my phone and I used to get off the train and walk to walk to the office in um, Carlton Gardens and used to love the feeling of opening my laptop. Well, sometimes not love it if no one had replied, but seeing, seeing what's, you know, what, 
you know, what candidates have come into my inbox or what clients have replied and like getting that buzz. And I was like, I want to recreate that for the next few months. All I get is problems. That's all I feel like. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, some days I open my laptop and I'm like, oh, right, okay, yeah, Yeah, nothing has happened. But I was just like, when you run a business, when you run the business, though, all you get is you just everything just filters up to to you, isn't it? Like, Sean, can you can I borrow you for five minutes? Like, fucking not again. All right, cool. Yeah, Um, but you know what? In three months, I'm going to have all of that, right? And in three months, I probably am going to have to get the emails on my phone. Or when we've got global teams, I'm obviously. You know, it's things will change a little bit, but for the next mm. three months, like, I want to enjoy. I just want to enjoy it, you know, and wow. not get too caught up or stressed about it. Well, Claire, it's been a pleasure for the second time. I've loved it, and um, I, you know, I, I'm I'm going to keep an eye on what you're doing. We'll keep in touch. We'll definitely have you back on for part three of this this uh, series that we're going through um, because I think I'll, you know, we need, I need to know what you guys are doing. I might even have you and James on at once. Cause I think that would oh. like, I think the, the microphones are just you and James in the room at the same time is, well, you fun. can only imagine. Well, if, if, yeah. if like, I can, I that might be like, that. that might be like, you know, proving my podcast skills. If I can navigate you two for an hour, I'm, 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 I'm coming. I'm, I'm raising my own. Skills. Oh. Yeah, do it. I would love. I think that'd be a really interesting social experiment. Me and James and you in a room. Let's see. Let's see how we get on. (laughs) Well, look. Let's keep an eye on you, please. Um, want you to know that you know from me personally, I wish you the best of luck. I think you've you know you're you're going to smash it, but I've got no doubt. Um, if anyone does want, I've already had a lot of people message me going, "Can can you put me in touch with James?" Um, Mm -hmm. if anyone's listening and they just want to pick your brains or ask you a question, are you you open for for that direct contact? Yeah. Of course. Claire at stormfree.com. Nice and simple. Or just yeah. me on this one. And that's no I in Claire, is it? It's C-L-A. No I in Claire. Like people do get it wrong and I pretend it's okay, but it's not okay. Well, I no get people I get people that start my like they reply to my email with with a hi Sean, S E A E S E A N. And then later on in the email they'll refer to me as S H A U N and I'm like, how have you changed my spelling in the last like 30 seconds? Different. I know. I was like, oh, they'll just reply, cheers, Sean. And it'll be the wrong spelling. I'll be like, but you've just read my email. Like, it's not that difficult. Anyway, um, <laughs> name, different problems for different people. Uh, but hopefully, if anyone wants to reach out, Storm2, uh, yeah. Storm3 email or LinkedIn will be the place. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, we'll catch you very, very soon. And and I want to just say to the listeners, thank you for um, always tuning in. You know, we, we appreciate every single one of you. Um, I hope you've enjoyed Claire's story. It's... Uh, you know, we're, we're right here at the at the beginning of such an incredible journey. When she's wor- when she's got two hundred people and this business is <laughs> pumping, you can listen back and re- and you know think, wow, look what she's achieved. And hopefully, you know, it inspires some of you guys as well to 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 think bigger. Um, if you've enjoyed today's show, please do me a favor, get on and share the episode. Put it in you you know email, WhatsApp, text, whatever, to someone that you think would benefit from this. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Give us a, a rating. Get in there. Give us five stars because it helps the guys at Apple push the podcast further. Um, I'll be back again on Wednesday next week. I've got some amazing guests lined up. Um, we've been tracking some of the top 100 fastest growing recruitment companies in the UK, and we have got a whole host of them coming through over the next couple of months. So I want to, you know, I want to really ramp up the, the 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 pace, I suppose, of of what people are doing and bring to you guys, you know, the people that are right on the edge of what, what what's possible in this sector. So um, I'll be back again next Wednesday. In the meantime, please stay safe and I'll see you soon.